Hey folks, we're continuing on. Working on the book. I'm working on the map for this book off and on all day because we've had so much going on. Still haven't recorded videos, but we'll get some done here in a minute. Here's the link to the book. So, that's what's going on. I'm going to put on some headphones here. Because, uh, take out the Take off the old robot ear. And then we will hook that up. Let's into some more dungeon synth. If you want to check out the band I'm listening to here, let me find it real quick. I'll send you there, band camp. 2 a.m. Eastern, yeah, it's 1 a.m. I'm in back in, I'm in Central Time now, so. We're gonna, what do we gotta finish here today? We need to do the forest. Should be fun. The forest, so when I do the forest, this is kind of what it looks like. But you zoom out and it, you know, it, it looks like a forest and not a bunch of weird little dinky trees. But you got to remember, like, you draw things at a, you know, at a small scale like this um, to give a, you know, the overall impression when you get big. One of the things I've thought about doing, which would be quite an undertaking, but I, I think I would have quite a bit of fun with it, is uh, doing this, but uh, like of the whole... The whole world like the whole fantasy world that i did and so that would be i think a lot of fun but uh it would have to be like a gigantic document like just uh absolutely massive you know make like a big four foot um textile for it i thought about it like you know if i do a crowdfund or something like that sometime then that would be like a really fun bonus that people could buy into so getting that giant um textile you know what i mean like a, a giant like textile map you want printed that's like eight by eight or like eight by four so we could put it on the wall and the, the idea would be the detail would be the same as it is in the book but there's so many different lands that it like spreads out across your whole wall you know so that these trees would still be like teeny tiny like if you get one of my books and open them up the trees are really small. I'm kind of blown up on the screen here to work on. Um, though if it was on a piece of paper, I'd still be I'd just be working really small. This just makes it easier for computer stuff, you know. So that's that's an idea. I think that's a little further down the road. Um, maybe when we do the I might do a crowdfund for. A box set or an illustrated edition of the first book, Water of Awakening. So I like to kind of, this time, you know, usually I just do all these like round trees because you get the impression of a trees, but I'm going to put some like conifers in there too so it looks a little more mixed up. This whole area is like a, it's called the Dobo Wold, so it's a big, it's a big like forested area. Once you kind of get up here, you can really just, you know, draw some trees, uh, you know, however you want. Uh, it doesn't matter that much. So this band is called Frere that I'm listening to. Um, nice shirt. What is it? Oh, Camelot. Yeah. I got that shirt. I saw them in San Francisco. Um, felt inclined to buy the shirt because I didn't actually pay for the show. The drummer got me in. Because he was a fan of the show, you know, he's a fan of the channel um, and the Star Wars reviews, I think. So uh, I got to hang out with the band and talk to him, which was great because I've I'd been listening to them for most of my adult life, certainly. And so yeah, that was a that was a really great show. And what a what a great uh, group of guys and what a great band. They sounded so good live. Um, Tommy's such a good singer, like his voice is so clear live. The band is so tight. 
Like it, it's a really good show if you ever get to see Camelot. Yeah, it was them in Sonata Arctica. Now Sonata Arctica was fine live, but they had just released like my least favorite Sonata Arctica album, and I had come out with a really bad review of it. So I didn't talk to them. <laughs> I didn't talk to them. I'm, I've, I should have gone and been like, hey, I'm a big fan. But that Talvio album is garbage. And it was. It was like the worst. I don't know what they were thinking. The production was, in particular, was really bad, you know. And just, like, the production was, I don't know what they were thinking. For, they said they wanted production that was more like their live production. But it just sounded muddy and, and bad. I, and the, the songs were really boring. Um, it just was not, it was just not a top album from them. Uh, they they needed to do something else. It's okay though, you know. I still like Sonata Arctica, and uh, still, you know, still favorite band, still one of my favorite bands for sure. But I'd say Camelot's a little more favorite. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't get to see Winter Sun really on the only tour I would care to see in the bond, which was um, the Time One tour. Because uh, after that, like Yari wasn't Yari quit playing guitar live. They'd barely done anything. They came out with what an album that that Yari did like in his garage. That was actually pretty good for what it was. It was very like I don't know. It was okay for what it was. It really was. But, you know, like, <laughs> what is Winter Sun Live at this point? Like, it's, it's Yari's band, but he just doesn't play guitar anymore. And the guitar playing is a big part of why I think Winter Sun is good to begin with, you know? I don't want to be too sloppy here with these little pine trees, these conifers. But you're not gonna you're gonna lose the like the feeling of these individual trees like once they're all drawn there. Yeah, it was a great show. Uh, we choose a pr particular projection for a world map, boy. That is a great question that I really need to think about. You know. I don't have an answer uh, because I've, you know, I would just kind of want to draw it flat. I don't know any other way to do it. I'd have to look at like what, what kind of projections were cartographers using um, like prior to, maybe prior to Columbus, you know, cartography was a very different space, right? You did keep drawing them big here. Um, you know, I, I kind of want to look at, at that. Like, what was it prior to Columbus? And kind of use that as a basis. Because, like, the way I, I do things now, it, it's very just inspired by, like, Tolkien and other, other fantasy maps which are really drawn in a more folksy kind of style. I guess is the best way to put it. These little conifers. Yeah, that's really the best way I could put it is like it's a folksy style. Um, so I don't know. What are some of the different, pro there's the Mercator projection. I'd probably just do it flat, like with, and not worry about longitude lines and just have it like the, what's the projection where everything gets stretched out at the top? Either that or, I don't know, make it round. Do you know what I mean? Like rounded edges? What's that projection? I don't remember all the names of the map projections right now. Yeah, we got a 
to figure out how far down is the forest actually going. It's going all the way down to here. I actually need to draw some more mountains. So the mountains actually are going to come up here to kind of block this off from the desert. Over here is the wasting desert. Apparently really old maps were interesting. Instead of bird's eye sort of view, they worked more on a on foot perspective and mainly listed notable landmarks. Yeah. Lots of blank areas because it was wilderness. You just didn't know really what was out there. And so you'd put the you'd put the important landmarks because that's what you were gonna use to find your way. The rule with Mercator, the higher the latitude, more distortion. That's the one I'm thinking of then. That's like the flat one. Do you think it's best when writing multiple genres, but hoping for some crossover customers to market by one brand name, using multiple author names or by one author name? It, I, I do everything with one author name. It really depends how many books you're writing. If you are writing a lot of books, like the number of pen names is really dependent on, in my opinion, the number of pen names is really dependent on how many books you're writing. Let's go over to mountains. Let's draw a few more mountains, shall we? Yeah, it's, it's entirely dependent on how many books you're going to sell. If you're writing 10 books a year, then yeah, pen names are worth it. If you're not writing that many books, um, then I, I don't recommend using lots of different pen names because you're just splitting your customer base, right? There could be crossover and you're kind of cutting yourself out of that. Um, the whole point of pen names is that you wouldn't want customers to um, like get confused about whose book, like what kind of book they're getting when they buy one of your books. That's like the point of the pen name, is that authors may not buy too many books by the same author per year. Uh, that was the old wisdom. And um, now I don't think that really holds up. You know, People will just buy the books they wanna buy and they're just not gonna worry about the books that they don't wanna read. You know, They'll just skip those books. So I actually would not worry about um, using lots of different pen names or anything like that. I just do it all with one one pen name and uh, try to court an audience based on your writing style and, and kind of what you're really delivering there. You know, C.S. Lewis published science fiction and um, fantasy under his regular name. So he did the, you know, the he did a sci-fi trilogy and he did um, the Chronicles of Narnia. Of course, he's more famous for Chronicles of Narnia, but um, you know, he did those all under C.S. Lewis. So certainly you can do it. I, I would say just stick with your name unless you're just writing a lot of books. You know, if you're writing uh, 10 or 20 books a year, then yeah, dude, pen name is going to be worth it for you. But if you're not writing that many books, then I would not worry about a pen name. Me personally, I wouldn't worry about it. All right, brought that mountain range up a bit. There we go. Looks good. And it's gonna really block us off because this whole section here is the wasting desert, so. Perfect. Let's fill all this in with the trees. This whole upper area here. <laughs> Draw some more trees here. 
this I've got to remember to draw them kind of big because the tendency for me at least is to draw them a little small yeah. but it's okay like some are big some are going to be small some will be um, big some will be lopsided some will be straight um, Most people are not going to see them super clearly. It's just going to look like a field of trees. And that's what we want, really. We want a field of trees. There's just a bunch of trees here. So you can have some that are a little misshaping. It doesn't matter. Happy little trees. Looks like Bob Ross says, you know. Do you think it would be risky to write mysteries? There's no risk, like, especially if you're starting out, there's not really risk. Like, you're not gonna upset anyone because they got a mystery. Like, you're gonna market it. And, and honestly, the algorithm is, is not gonna direct people who aren't gonna read your books to, to the wrong book. You know, they do it by book. I, I really, the more I think about it, I think you're, you don't need as much of a pen name unless you're really trying to manage really divergent markets like romance if you're writing romance in something else then it's probably um, a good idea to have a pen name because those audiences are really different and the um the romance audience is not going to be interested in your literary books um to the same degree at all and the people who are interested in your literary books are really not going to be interested in your romance books at all either. So because those two markets are pretty separate, that's when I would really think about it. But if you're writing romance novels, chances are, you know, you're you're writing a lot of books. Romance is, is a pretty uh, kind of schlocky area. As far as like the amount of books that people write, people write like huge series in romance and huge numbers of books. Need more conifers, you know. Just to mix it up. And we'll do some trees down here. I think I mentioned it years ago, but I highly recommend Blood Meridian. I, uh, you know, I don't know if that book's for me, but I'll try reading it again. He's the one who wrote, oh, he wrote No Country for Old Men. Yeah, that's right. I don't know. It's okay if you like something that I'm just not interested in. I've read plenty of like modern nihilistic fiction. Get a little bit tired of it after a while. Search up 1587 World Map by Urbano Monti. Thank you for the super chat. Yeah, let's let's take a look there. I gotta have my keyboard in my lap right now. I need like a cool setup where I can have I got the tablet in front of me. And like I got a keyboard in my lap, you know. <laughs> oh, this is cool, yeah. World map of 1587. Here, let me let me show this to you guys. Okay, let's take a look. There's two different ones here, right? So here's one. 
that's it from the top, right? With like and dark this I think flat earthers are super inspired by this. So they like imagine, you know, like a giant wall of ice around the edge of the earth here. South America, North America, uh, you know, Greenland. This would be Madagascar, India. I guess Australia would be up here. Kind of Australia. Australia looks gigantic because of the distortion. Here's another one. This is a little different. Oh, someone put it on a put it on a sphere. Isn't that cool? Look at this. This is rad. Can you guys see this? This is so cool. Yeah, someone projected it onto a sphere, mapped it onto a sphere. Kind of weird they didn't know what was over there. They thought this was a bigger thing than it was, the Amazon Delta. Florida's a little nub, just Cuba, right? What island is this? I think this is Dominican Republic and Haiti, but it's just like huge for some reason. There's a Yucatan. Um, you know, they thought that there was maybe like a Northwest Passage, like a way around. Here's India and, you know, Southeast Asia. Philippines and Japan, I guess in here somewhere. In this kind of Australia. That's pretty neat. Yeah, that's pretty cool. If you guys want to check that out, here, I'll link it. I'll link it in chat. Yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> As an accurate description of the world with all the continents before 1600 Golden Age navigation. Yeah. Is it realistic to make at least $1,000 a month writing pulp style and selling on Amazon? It is realistic. But the, the caveat is what are you going to be doing to get that $1,000? Okay, you got to be right. You have to be writing a lot of books, and it will take a while to build up to a thousand dollars. Okay, so to get a thousand bucks a month, you probably need to have twenty books out. And if you want to get there sooner, then you need to be writing. You can look up the Facebook group like Twenty Books to Fifty K, and they have a strategy for trying to get to fifty thousand dollars worth of sales a year by writing twenty books. Basically, if you write a series and like you release one book a month and it's in a series where you're really targeting the audience hard, yeah, you can make a thousand bucks a month. You know, it's not that hard. If you're wanting to do what I do, which is write whatever the hell I want to write and make a thousand dollars a month, not that, not that realistic or it's just going to take you a long time and you're going to have to do a lot of extra stuff. Okay. So there's no, you know, there's no... You know, it's not unrealistic. It's just you have to do some work to get there. And it's quite a bit of work. It'll end up being quite a bit of work before you're done. And it'll take you a while to build up to that. It's like, how do I make $1,000 a month on YouTube? Well, you have to have a lot of subscribers and you have to have a lot of views. You got to be getting like a couple hundred thousand views a month, at least, to, to get to $1,000. That's a lot. That's really hard to get to. It could take years to build up that kind of audience or multiple viral videos to get that kind of um, income just to get a thousand dollars versus the guys who have like millions of views a month and are able to to rake in huge amounts of money um, it's very difficult you got to be in like the top one percent to even get like a thousand dollars a month um, so just keep that in mind it takes a while to build up there you have to put out a lot of books and you got to be willing to do um, you got to be willing to do a lot you got to be willing to market and you got to be willing to write books that people want to read. Um, like I said, I, I, I honestly do not think it's 
it's unrealistic at all. The only thing it might be unrealistic for is like, I want to do that while also being really creative with my fiction. Because for me, you know, uh, you know, we make jokes about this sometimes is like, is, is the fiction your personal creative expression or is it, you know, is it a product? Well, for me, it's actually my personal creative expression. And I just kind of want to see who likes it. For other people, it's going to be a product. And there's no nothing wrong with using it, saying, I'm going to be a professional at this and I'm going to make the stuff people want to read. There, That is absolutely awesome because you're producing something people want to read. That is good, right? Someone's getting the product they want. But I'm kind of making what I want to exist. That's my bigger concern. I don't ignore marketing. Like I try to make covers that will sell. I try to do marketing so that people will know that my books exist, right? I do all that stuff. The question is like how far to the left or the right are you gonna go? Um, Cause you can make some money selling, you know, vampire romance, for example or something like that you could you could you could write romance novels and um do okay i think um you know you could be even chuck tingle and make money he writes those ridiculous gay erotica stories that she's like you know my my lawyer's a raptor and also gay and i had sex with him there's you know that that kind of stuff which is really funny and his covers are hilarious if you don't know who chuck tingle is just Google him and and enjoy. You know, what is playing now? Oh, old sorcery is old sorcery playing now? Yes, old sorcery. So this is the one that's playing now. I mean, let me go ahead and link them. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can make a thousand bucks. A month. You know. So it's, it's up to you, you know, what you want to do and how you want to approach it. Or maybe you want to do more of a blend between the two. It's like, you know, I really want to write mysteries. I just love mystery stories and, you know, they really excite me. But I don't want to just write the, the same old detective stories everybody else is writing. I want to write stuff that's really interesting and will get people's attention and make them think. Well, great that is awesome because the mystery genre needs people like that but um, you may not sell as much as the guy who's just doing detective schlock right same thing with fantasy it's like you know i do i do like kind of highbrow philosophical fantasy and oops that's not gonna be everyone's cup of tea most people want brandon sanderson world building and you know basic plots and very little deeper stuff that's okay Dude, i have no problem with that I'm, i love brandon sanderson um i like his work ethic especially um the guy's the guy's an absolute monster as far as his ability to continually put out things that his fans love um and Yeah, we're up in the corner now, right? I'm gonna probably draw some more mountains here. Oh, I was drawing this in the wrong, oh crap. I drew all those on the wrong layer. Oh well, I do this sometimes. It's okay. I need to pay better attention to what layer I'm drawing in. I find mountains. Mountains are gonna. The whole point of doing the layers is that you're not covering things up too much. So that when you draw on top of something or you erase something, you're not erasing too much. And that things are kind of on top of each other.
Just add another little couple mounts here. trees layer you know see if I can actually put some trees in the trees layer here I think that's going to be our forests here. That's probably enough forests. Let's see if we're going to extend it anywhere. And if we want to add any more forests. Probably want to add some forests here. And there's also going to be, these are all plains up here, all the way to the north. Probably put some forests here. You know, so this is the, this is the big forest up here. I think that'll look okay. I think one good solution might be to write all kinds of wildly different stories, but all featured the same protagonist. Doctor Who did that for decades, yeah. I feel like urban fantasy was a genre that had a lot of flexibility. It did, but eventually it all ended up as Dresden copies because that was what was most popular. Yeah, it reminds me of a blog post by Indie Game dev it was like you hit that sweet stuff between the sweet spot between stuff that makes money and stuff that i want to do <laughs> um that's tough though like it's tough to you know it's tough to to have that sweet spot it's really hard it's really hard to find the things that i'm excited to do um you know right here we're in the trees area we're going to do some little swamps some swamps here. These are all marshlands. You know, you get like a big delta here and then we're gonna have a big bayou. I kind of live in the bayou now, guys. It's kind of fun, Buffalo Bayou. Where there's the largest breeding group of alligators, American alligators. Pretty cool, if you ask me. I think alligators are pretty cool. Cops had to get one from my neighbor's house the other day. That was fun. Had a eight or 10 foot alligator hanging out on someone's porch. Fun times, that by all. You know, 
I'm going to put a couple trees right here. I like Dungeon Synth. It's it's kind of similar to a lot of the music I I do, you know. Theme and variations based, uh, you know, ambient kind of music. Uh, Popeye says a dipping sauce called Bayou Buffalo. Yeah, the Buffalo Bayou is a uh, is the river here that goes through Houston, um, goes through Harris County, and. Um, kind of interesting it got majorly flooded during what hurricane was it uh, big one a while ago hurricane like my whole neighborhood flooded except for like my house so I looked at that it's like this is the only house this is the high point of the whole area is my house is like on a hill I'm like perfect Everything floods. I have to get out in a rowboat. That's okay. My stuff's okay. Put my PC up on a table and it's going to be okay. <laughs> Reminds me of Brian. Honestly, it was kind of mad, but it broke the urban fantasy mold enough with modern cop stuff that people were talking about. It was very, it was very much like Shadowrun. The, um, the writer for it got canceled like almost immediately because of sex pest stuff, which basically means... You know uh, that that was the end of Bright, you know. <laughs> so, um, but you know, it it was very reminiscent to me of Shadowrun, and it was actually very well done for what it was. Um, and I didn't, I really didn't dislike it. Uh, I I talked about it on the channel. I was like, really, there should be more fantasy like this. I would really like the world to have more fantasy in it. That's interesting and and kind of a little bit different from what we're what we normally see um but maybe that's like kind of too much to ask um it was one of netflix's things to be like you know we're we're going to do a uh, stay home instead of go out movie and that's what bright ended up being All right, we got the Wasting Desert over here. We've got the Al Shafal, the Peninsula, the Kingdom. These are all plains. And I don't know if there's any more forests I need to add. I think this is probably good enough. So I think as far as the map details go, this is probably good enough for what we need to do. Um, what we can do, I don't know if I have time to do this, and it just doesn't matter that much. Oops. There it goes. What happened here? Uh, what would you suggest for making mystery stories that stand out from the rest like you mentioned? Well, the most famous mystery series is not what you would think of. It's actually Harry Potter. So Harry Potter is a really good example of basically mashing two genres together and coming up with a formula that ends up being something people really love. So a lot of people focus on the world building of Harry Potter and that's fine and it works okay. And I think that attracts a lot of people and it's good enough. But what makes the books good, like no one would care about those if they didn't enjoy reading those books. They're mysteries. So they're mystery books, but in a fantasy setting. So if you took a mystery format and you just changed one thing, you could have a Western mystery and, and produce something really interesting. You could have a mystery that's more like a Lovecraft Cthulhu mythos mystery, which are mysteries in a sense. Uh, they're mystery format, I should say. Something like Call of Cthulhu or um, maybe at the Mountains of Madness. Both of those 
are pretty close to the mystery format. So if you're doing the mystery format, but just put it in a slightly different area, people get really, they end up really liking it because the, a plot for a mystery is really interesting. If you can execute a mystery plot well, people will keep turning those pages. They gotta find out what happens. So you leave clues to a, you, you create a problem that is a mystery that has to be solved. There's a problem we don't know how to fix it. And we're gonna go and investigate and use our minds to try to figure out how to fix the problem. That's a mystery story. And that's what they do in the first Harry Potter book. Oh, what's being hidden in the tower? Oh, it looks, I, I, we think Snape is trying to get this thing. Harry Potter knows that it's something taken from the vault. So there's all these clues. They figure out that there's a three-headed dog named Fluffy. They figure out how to get past it. So they've solved the mystery of what it is. It's the Philosopher's Stone and who's trying to get it and how to stop them. So um, you could do the same thing in any kind of setting. You could do that in a, in a, a ghost story mystery, which I think is, um, in fact, I'll have one coming out I wanted to come out with it years ago, but I just, I don't know. Sometimes I sit on these stories because I don't know why. Because they're too weird. Like they, they break the, bolt, the mold and I lose confidence that I'm going to be able to sell them. But I have one called A Walk at Dusk and I'll put it out. I promise you guys I'll put it out. Um, All Shafalda is, this book here is one that I uh, was really hesitant to put out because it's so different from other kinds of fantasy that most people read these days. It's like something from the Silmarillion or Children of Who Ren or something like that. It's more mythic, but it's a Shakespearean love tragedy in like a fantasy setting. So it's very different from what um, it's very different from what you would usually get in a fantasy book. Unless you really like Michael Moorcock, because he does some of that stuff too. It's a five-act tragedy. That's what All Shafalda is. I wrote it in 2020. All the election crap happened. I'm like, I don't think I want to release this in 2020. It's just, it's too depressing a time in a year to be releasing, um, you know, tragic fiction, I felt like. Maybe I was wrong to do that. Maybe I was wrong to sit on it, and, and maybe, maybe I should have just come out with it. But I'm coming out with it now because I just feel like you really you really need to publish like everything that you do. You know, you need to make an effort to publish um, whatever you're doing. Oh, rivers, yeah. Let's do the rivers a little bit. There we go. Nice big river there. Let's scroll down a bit. A the little lake there. Whoops. Oh, this has a tilt function. Erase some of this river. Get any kind of spot that I feel like is just too thick or there's a little too much. I'm just gonna erase that, you know. Kind of fix the little details here, you know. See, like that. Something like that. It's a really thick river, man. What am I doing here? There we go. Let's go back to zero. There we go. The tilt helps. Like it, it's a cool feature of Clip Studio, so you can like rotate your drawing so that you're always using a really comfortable stroke. Is there a way to write significantly unusual mysteries without science fiction or fantasy elements? Yeah, Western, ghost stories. Um, you could write something in cyberpunk. You could do something in. Um, You know, yeah, there's 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 other settings. 
besides that, right? You could write a, a romance that's a mystery as well. A romantic mystery. That would work too. All of those are options, and I think pretty good options. So just think about some other genres or some other settings, and you may find yourself with a pretty unique uh, take on um, on fantasy. I realize I have like a pretty big empty spot here, and I'm not sure what is going to go there. I think I might want to take these mountains and actually kind of slide them over a little bit. Um, either that or I kind of wish I made the bay a little bigger, but I mean, it looks okay for what it is. I think these are just more planes. It's usually we want some kind of feature there. Otherwise, it's going to look a little too empty. So these are planes here. Let's put a lake. I think lakes are cool. And it might have like a little Sea of Galilee kind of thing here, you know? So we're on the rivers. Let's get a little bigger one. Let's get 10. And we'll draw our um, tributary here. And a tributary going like this and up to those mountains. So we have a lake being fed by the mountains. And then we'll, let's zoom in a little bit. There we go. Kind of go in here. Let's get down to six. There we go. There's our lake. I think that's good. It's like a little sea, sea of Galilee kind of thing there, you know? Do you know how well 1930s style hard-boiled mysteries do or don't sell these days? I don't because I don't write that genre, so I haven't thoroughly researched it. Um, so that's, you know, that's how it is. I, don't, I can't tell you, but I still think there's, there's definitely a market for mysteries. You know, um, The Da Vinci Code was a mystery and was very well loved by many people. So you can look at that as an example to follow. Extend this. Uh, I don't need to be on the trees. Extend the trees over this way. Like that. Okay. I think that looks pretty good. Need to draw a couple features on this island here which is not going to be any big deal. We're just going to draw a couple of mountains, a couple of hills here. And just kind of shade those like that. This really shouldn't be a mountain. It should be more like kills. So let's do those again. Yeah. 
me see. All right, I need to actually do some details down here because we do have some uh, mountains here that are not big, but they are mountains. There's a couple of mountains at the bottom of this peninsula. Kind of unique geographic feature here. my rivers. I'm just going to erase part of this tributary here and back to mountains. Oh, what was I on? Trees. Let's get rid of those. And let's do a good mountain right here. Yes, you can have mountains by the coast because they exist in California and also in like Chile. So yeah, you totally can have mountains right by the sea. Not that uncommon. And there's those. And we'll have a couple of hills right here. You know, if you want to, you can kind of shade the hills a little bit. kind of shaded in here and get some more hills I think we're just about done like refining this map kind of getting it into shape here for our release date I got to get this done tomorrow I got to get the ebook uploaded tomorrow night so that it's uh, ready to go and the paperback I'll probably do that tomorrow too just so that it's all done uh, Sam, I'm still on the trees. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, thinking along the lines of Nancy Drew or the Hardy Boys in terms of story formula. The more Shamler, Hammond, Harpole, Edge, a series of standalones. That yeah, might be. It might work. You can always try and see what happens. You know. But I don't know. You can use something like Publisher Rocket to see how those keywords are doing, and that'll give you a little bit of insight as to like how maybe the genre is doing. And whether you want to take your time to to write a book in that, so um, yeah, you can use you can use it's a, it's called a publisher rocket, and uh, you can use it to do quite a bit of research into what keywords and genres are popular on um, on Amazon. I think that is a subscription. Uh, no, it's not a subscription software. You buy it once and then you have it. So that's pretty good. Um, I have it. I don't really use it much. You know, it's not, it's not a software that I use a lot, but it definitely is very useful if you're trying to do market research, I think. In a couple Rivers tend to like flow from mountains. So you get this kind of effect here. Maybe another tributary here. Maybe one like that. Then you have these dry hills. And you're not going to really be getting anything from those. All right. 
I think most of our details are probably good to go here. I think I'm now on the trees layer. I, I'm getting all my layers confused. It's all right. I think I write, might, a horror, might write a horror mystery book. Um, I had an idea for a while. I believe it's got most of the details worked out. That's good. You know, horror mystery works really good. That's like Lovecraft. Very popular. People really enjoy a good horror mystery. I um, mean, that's that's kind of what I wrote with um, Eyes in the Walls. You know, it's kind of horror mystery. So, you know, kind of more supernatural horror, really. Psychological horror. People really like that one, though. Okay. Trees aren't quite the same size as each other, but it doesn't matter. Um, they're close enough, so. I'm going to go up here. I'm going to draw these trees so that they're basically going off the end of the map up here. Because that's how big this forest is. You know, this forest is big. It's basically like this the giant Carpathian forest of my setting. Is this uh this setting up here or this uh, area up here? Yeah, we want to draw it kind of going off the edge here. Carpathian Forest. I think that's probably okay there all right I think uh, I think we're good here the other thing we could do is like we could do a color map you know if you want to if you want to do that I guess I'll show you how to do some color I think colors fun um, 
but because I'm publishing it, this is really to be seen on, on black and white paper, I think it's probably not worth my time to do color. You guys want me to do color? Or do you think it would be a good idea to write a series of unrelated Weird Tales novels under a seri series name? I think, well, I mean, it worked for Goosebumps and Tales from the Crypt. Yeah, I mean, it could work. Um, your brand name is going to be like the series name, and it's, yeah, they're, I think it could work. I mean, it's worked for Goosebumps. As long as you bill it as like something, things are different. Oh, I missed the super chat. Sorry. You think compelling maps and world build synchronize a level of science and myth that impacts the cultural demographics within fantasy? That's an interesting way of putting it. Yeah, I think to some extent you're probably correct. Um, so when you have a map that shows a bunch of extra details that don't appear in the story, it makes you feel like the story takes place in a real place. And it also gives the reader a little bit of a sense of wonder. Like, what is this, you know, what's this area up here, right? Like, what is? what are these trees? It's called the Dobo Wold. Well, that's not even in the story. So why is it there? Well, it's in the other stories. And if you've been reading my fantasy books, you'll see, oh, wait, I know a character that's from that area. I know a character that's from there. Wasn't she in, wasn't she in Needle Ash? Yeah, she was. Oh, that's where that is, you know. So it gives you a little bit of extra stuff, like oh, I, I remember these places from this other book. I remember this from I remember this from oh, there's the wasting desert. That's where it is. So it puts everything in context. And if a reader hasn't read anything, if he hasn't read the wasting desert yet, well, then he might want to go read it. Uh, he might want to find out more about that that wasteland that's over there on the right hand side of the map, you know. Um, so I think it does. To, to some level. The, the whole point, you know, you, you say it, it synchronizes a level of science and myth. So when we talk about the world building, like Sanderson world building is replacement science. It's magic as science. It's the physics of the world. And um, all fantasy books will have this to some extent, but with something like Sanderson, you get like some really hard rules that are easy to understand. And that kind of boxes in the plot and in, uh, when he does it really well, you'll notice that like the magic system actually has a solution. The magic system is the solution for the plot, uh, like in the case of the first Mistborn book. Um, you know that twist that happens at the end is really because they, you have to know all of the rules of the allomancy magic in order to figure out the, the solution to the plot. So those things work. So yeah, I think maps make it more tangible it makes it more real it makes it seem like a real living place where people actually are that you could go explore um that somebody existed in yeah and so i think the, i think that as far as the demographics that are interested in fantasy you got to think about how they cross over a lot of them are people that are interested in world building because they like science fiction they like new rules for stories so a hard magic system is a bit like science fiction, like, you know, uh, any kind of hard science fiction where you have rules to the story that you're kind of making up as you, you make them up and then that determines the plot. So people are attracted to that. People are also like maps because they like tabletop games, which are very influenced by fantasy and in turn influence fantasy. That the idea of a magic system is really rooted in RPG playing. So when people see a map, they may think of RPG games like Dungeons and Dragons or uh, GURPS or Pathfinder or any of these uh, RPGs where they take place in a realm. Like if you're playing a lot of, say, um, you know, Dungeons and Dragons Edition 3 with like, what was in, in Edition 3? Neverwinter? Or was it Forgotten Realms? Was that second edition? One of them was Forgotten Realms. And one of them was like Neverwinter, or Neverwinter was part of Forgotten, well, Forgotten Realms. And then you had Greyhawk was the setting for the first D&D. &D. It's the default setting. So you feel like you're living in a place that's alive, and the rule set makes that, makes that world come alive. So all of those demographics, I think, kind of cross-pollinate with each other a lot. Um, you know, there's a funny one called Stoneworks that has an entertaining format of world building. 
Yeah, so I think those those things a lot. It piques people's creativity when they want to play D and D. D and D is a bit of a creative exercise for a lot of people. Even though I'm more on the old school side and view it as like rules first because the rules create the story. The story is the experience you have playing. Other people like the idea of a setting that exists and you're exploring it and exploring a story. Um, I'm more on the exploring a setting side and not so much experiencing a story side. But either way, people get very creative. They come up with a setting and then they get their characters to experience a story in that setting. That's what they want. So of course, those demographics are gonna cross pollinate a lot with the idea of maps. And, you know, we've got to say, hey, like, there's been maps in Moorcock, there's been maps in Tolkien, there's been a lot of maps, there's maps of Hyboria. So the idea of a map may just makes the fantasy world feel like it's a real place that you want to go visit. Um, yeah, uh, you got to read Appendix N. So I'm going to link it real quick. Hold on. That is not it. There you go. Appendix N, The Literary History of Dungeons and Dragons. And I'll link it to you guys right now. So yeah, this is the stuff that really influenced Dungeons and Dragons. It's Jack Vance. It is stuff like Fafford and the Grey Mouser, which I talked about by Fritz Leiber. Um, those things are really more influential than Tolkien by a lot. And Moorcock is more influential. Lots of things are more influential, I think, than Tolkien and Dungeons and Dragons. But Tolkien is this sort of behemoth of fantasy where everybody goes first to think of Tolkien. And I love Tolkien's stuff, but I like a lot of other fantasy too, you know. Um, Michael Moorcock, yeah. No, oh, something happened with the sound. Something happened with the sound. Wonder what happened. I would pause it because I haven't interacted in a long time. Should I read Crown of Sight before Al Shafalda? You can. Uh, you don't have to, but Crown of Sight has things. There are things that happen in Crown of Sight which affect Al Shafalda, but they're explained. So if you just read Al Shafalda and you want to read like tragic mythic fantasy, everything that you need to understand the story is in that story. And then you can go read Crown of Sight and know, oh, this is this artifact and this is how it works. And this is why it matters for this story. So there's an artifact from the first book which has an impact on the second. And we'll have an impact on the third Eternal Dream book, the next long book that I'll put out too. It's a really important little piece of magic that can make stories take some wild turns. So um, yeah, just... You could, you could buy either one. Uh, Crown of Sight is a two-hour read. It only takes you an hour and a half to two hours to read it. What I specifically did for Crown of Sight is I designed it so that it was really a... How should I put this? Oh, I wanted to rename it. Uh, so what I did for Crown of Sight is I really set it up so that um, it would be, where's that paint bucket? Here we go, refer to other layers. Sorry, it's basically just the last battle of a fantasy novel. I'm like, fantasy novels are boring except for the last battle. I'm gonna write a book that's just the last act. And that's what Crown of Sight is. And so I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty excited about that. You know, it's not everybody's cup of tea, obviously, but uh, I rather liked it. Let's see if that will color. Yeah. So that does an okay job. Problem with coloring here is we may have to like turn off some of the coast here. Let's see if that does it. Yeah. Okay, so then, you know, we, this is a color layer that we can turn off or turn on as much as we want. And then we'll turn this stuff on. And we may want to just, there we go. Let's zoom in.
This is our base blue. See, this got colored, so we'll just color this one back white real quick as we go through here. And let's, where's our eyedropper tool? See, now I really want the eyedropper tool. <laughs> Uh, here's my eyedropper. There it is. All right. Paint bucket. So yeah, chronocytes basically like last act. You know, what could I do for the last act of a fantasy novel? And... Um, this one's really a five act tragedy. So very different approaches to what we're doing here. I'll just color that. Yeah. So yeah, if we want to make a little color one, we can, we have a lot of color here to work with. Oh, and yeah, we've got to color the, um, the lake here. Boop, boop. There we go. So now if we want to add some other color, we can. What are your thoughts on trying to keep all elements of a fantasy setting consistent with the Genesis creation story? I don't know. I have no thoughts about that. Yeah, it's exclusively the high emotion, fast paced climax of the story with only hints of the bigger picture sounds wild. Yeah, that's the idea. It's like, we're just doing the last the last act. Um, now you get enough setup in there to know what's going on, but like, it's basically a siege and it's just the end of, end of the book. Um, so it's about 20,000 words and there's a lot that's packed into it. Um, Yeah, so we got some blue. Obviously, this this would only I could only really ship this with the ebook with blue like this, um, but we could do different colors for different things. Actually, I need to color all these white, so let's do white. Um, and what we'll actually we'll color them, and let's go ahead and pick a color. But we'll actually do like a a, a mild yellow for the land here. Let's see, and we'll do all the. And we'll like recolor it from there. This is just for fun at this point. And we will do, where's our dropper? So these are what I call flats. Um, the whole point of doing the flats is this is just like the base and then you can do um, other shading. I think map, maps look fine with just like the flat colors. Like this. They really do, even if you're doing color maps. Like the more shading you do on the map, the, the crazier the map can look and the harder the map can be to read. So it's up to you, like how you want to do your own maps. But for me, I really like to do flatter colors with just a little bit of other shading. Let's see. Okay. We start with like a base color for the land. and a base color for the water. And then we can do some really cool like coloring with this if we want to. And what I really need to do next is the words. I mean, I, I guess I'm gonna wait till tomorrow because I was just kind of thinking about trying to answer questions while doing other stuff. Like this will actually look fine. We're gonna, we're gonna recolor all, all of the trees and everything so this doesn't really matter much that there's white here. Um, we just kind of want basic flat colors here. Okay. 
Then we're gonna color all the trees green. So I'm not gonna worry about like getting every little tree kind of filled in here. Let's see. Yeah, it looks okay. All right, then from here, add another layer. This is like a top layer. And we can just grab a spray paint brush and start painting some green here, you know, like this. Let's do a little darker green on top here. There we go. Forests, I like to be kind of darker green, you know. So the white doesn't matter because we're just going to color it kind of green here, as you can see. Just kind of spray painting it in here. You can also do this with like watercolor brush or something if you want to. Doesn't matter. We're just kind of getting some different layers here. And I'll, I might paint some lighter green on top here too. But I kind of like the, the spray brush because you can kind of pile the color up here and get some different colors. Um, then we'll do like a Uh, well, let's just shrink it down, do some detail work here. Do it a little bit lighter here to do the edges. Do it a little bit bigger than that, 17. There we go. That's all we need, Something like that. And what we're gonna do here, let's get it to kind of there. A little bit bigger here, maybe 25. We're just gonna paint in these river valleys in the green too. Some very good colors here. Gonna paint over the white here. There's no wrong way to do it. Just do whatever you wanna do. It's your map. Your map, your way. And you can also, I think I have a blur. Where's my like blur? Here, blender. Just kind of blend like that. Boop, boop. Kind of softens out the colors even more. See? Kind of scribble blend. And it gets it like that. Let's do a. There we go. And I really like to paint these rivers a little bit lighter like this, yeah. And then we might want to like a gray here for the marsh. I'm a gray color. Maybe even more yellow gray. Hmm. There we go. Our blender here. Gonna blend it up like that. Yeah. Back to our brush. Nice light green. Like that again. We can just kind of color these areas that are uh, green, something a little bit lighter here. Nice green areas here. And this is kind of how I would color a map. I don't know if I really want to like spend the time coloring this map. Because, you know, I'm not really going to do anything with the color. My dropper. Let's go back to our smear. You can kind of smear these. See, just kind of smears the edges. 
turns it into kind of a watercolor effect. It's really nice. Like you can get some really like very nice effects here with this very subtle kind of coloring the whole map here, kind of smearing the paint around. And you can color the mountains brown or gray or whatever, you know, whatever color you want. Well, the, the river valleys are, are green. I don't know if you've ever been to a river, but things grow next to the river, so that's why they're green. They're actually drawn as black, as you can see. I wouldn't draw them blue, you know. And then you can kind of fill it out and in, out into the plains. Obviously, this is going to be pretty green around here. Anything with a lot of rivers is going to be green. Watercolor brush tends to work pretty good too. We just use this blender and blend it all. And it's all happening like underneath our line work, as you guys can see. So it becomes a much more subtle effect as we kind of blur it out. Same thing here, just color all this around here nice and green. And then kind of blend it. So yeah, as you as you take a look, things get things take on different colors. They get a little bit more um, colorful, I guess. Let me show you what I do with the water. So let's do another layer, and I'm just going to do water here. So for water. I'll maybe take a, a light blue here, almost an aqua, like this. And then you can paint some shallow water with this, um, with this thing. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to put it underneath the greens. And we have flats here. We can even put it underneath the flats if we wanted to. But um, we'll do it like this. Really, I should have this be a separate layer like the the yellow should be a separate layer on top of um, yeah I should have done this as two layers if I really wanted to do this correct green rivers and white mountains you don't need to worry about the white mountains because the mountains will be colored brown water do water all right, I'll just show you how I how I would do the water. We'll do a small brush, um, and we'll do it with this. Let me just kind of go around the edge here, and anywhere that's shallow, we're going to color it with this nice aqua color here. Um, we can even do this with a, instead of this, let's do a, a round watercolor brush. And, oops, a little too big. Let's drop that down to like 30. So we're really kind of laying it on here. And it starts off kind of transparent, as you can see. But we just kind of color around the coastlines, where the lines are. Gives it an extra little effect here. So the deep water stays pretty blue, but the shallow water will be rather light. And then we're going to use our blender here. Do the same thing. Just kind of blend, kind of blend it around the edges where we drew it, so that it is a little bit more subtle. Watercolor brush. You can even do wet wash. Or like India ink. But watercolor is good because it's a little more subtle. Oops. I don't want a brush pen. still want the 
wire color brush. Yeah. So anyway, that's 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 really how I do. And same thing like here, just kind of color all the water a little bit lighter color, a little bit lighter color here. And yeah. That's, so that basically you get this kind of subtle effect around the coastlines of a lighter color. I might even make this a little bit more teal, like could bring a little more green into it. So it looks really bright, maybe just more saturated. So it looks really pretty. Just like that. You know, it's an extra detail. Just kind of blend it a little bit here at the blend tool. So it kind of softens that edge. It's a subtle effect, you know, it's subtle. Um, high concentration of green indicates a delta of fertile sediments, and you can reference there's flooding like the Yangtze, Amazon, Netherlands. Yeah, uh, if you look where I live, man, it's as green as you could be. It's super green. You know, this is going to be a fertile area. All of this, country, both of these countries are like super fertile green areas. Um, you know, up here too, it's all a river. I mean, it's all a forest. Uh, here, I kind of like to make marshes. You know, a little more gray, I guess. But uh, anyway, I don't think I'm gonna. I'm, I don't think I'm gonna do this whole map as like color, because it's just not, not like really worth my time. I'm just having fun hanging out with you guys. So that's what that's about. I'm gonna go through and blend it. You know, blend the edges so that you can't see where the edge of the brush was. I think I actually do like the the soft brush here better. This puts a little more color on the page. And then we blend it, it kind of just more subtle, you know? Anyway. Or we can do a blur, which would just kind of blur the edges. Do this, which is a blur. There you go. That's that's good. Um, here's what I would do for mountains. Is like if I wanted to make the mountains brown or gray, you just can select that like a brown color. You know, these are kind of barrier mountains, so they're probably going to be brown. Um, and then you just use a kind of a bigger spray, 50. You just kind of color the area. Uh, whatever color you want. What am I doing here? Come back here. It's kind of a brown color. You know, it looks really bad right now, but we're gonna we're gonna blend it in pretty nice here. And then we're gonna erase some of the edges too. So point is to get we don't want it to look too uniform in color. And then I'll usually select a, a lighter color too, like this, and then we'll kind of um, do some extra stuff with that color too. So I do two colors together. Like that. And I'll do a ton of color maps because you never see them in color. So I don't know. I did a color map for an ebook, one of the ebooks. I don't remember which one. And I liked it a lot, but it, uh, you know, oh, wait, we want blend. There we go. You know, um, I liked it. I like doing it, but I, I think very few people saw the color map <laughs> to like to like it or to dislike it. If you know what I mean. So yeah, now we're just kind of blending those two colors together and we get some really interesting effects here, as you can see.
winning with the yellow behind. And kind of through that blending action, you get something that's a lot more subtle. Then you can turn on your eraser, of course, and just erase anything that's out there. Um, if we do like a, now we want the eraser. You want a soft eraser, and you just kind of do soft erase, just like that, so that it, it feels like it's more on the mountains versus kind of flowing over them. Just kind of tidies up the edges a bit, as you can see. I think that looks quite a bit better already. And of course, we can do the same thing. We go to the greens. We can do the same thing with the greens. Just tidy up the edges so that it looks like it's on the trees. No one's going to be looking like super intimately close with this, but we just want it to look like, you know, it's on the trees. <laughs> That's the main thing. I think I'm on, I'm on the I'm on the water layer, water and mountains. As you can see, there you go. There you go. Okay, so that's how I do mountains. Oh yeah, let's add some snowy caps. Great idea. So um, let's do these up here. Would these have snowy caps? These would have some snowy caps. So let's do some. Actually, these wouldn't because they're they're too far south. Um. I mean, these might. Oh, we'll just put some snowy caps on here. Um, so all we do is make it white, and then we can pick a brush here, maybe uh, like a really small watercolor brush, and then we can just kind of brush white on. Which is not doing anything. <laughs> Let's try a um, try oil paint. Yeah, there, now we're getting it. Make it really pale white. Let's go down pretty small here. Just put some snowy caps on them like that. Um, really, to do like a lot of snow, we'd have to. Uh, you know, we'd have to really like cover up the, the black. But yeah, see, so you could do some snowy caps. Just color white on top of the brown. And uh, then you have some snowy, snow peak caps. Maybe others are not as snowy. So there you go, snowy caps. All right, I think I'm gonna pause on the color stuff and I'm gonna do this. So if I wanna take the color stuff off, it's really easy. We just um, go down here and start turning off the colors. Export this and get it into Photoshop to work with it in Photoshop. And I, I need to go to sleep. So that's the last step. We'll export it, put it in Photoshop. We'll do all of the text in Photoshop tomorrow. So I'll do that tomorrow and book will be ready to go. I'll get one last question going here. Okay, that's the but snow caps can indicate extremely high elevation like the Himalayas. That's true. Um, sidestep the problem of tropical climates. It's very true. The Himalayas are pretty far south, and yet they're bitter cold because of how high they are. Andes as well. The Andes Mountains. So. Yeah. 
So floodplains, you know, it's kind of interesting because like floodplains, that's like where you're going to grow a lot of grains and rice, it's like swamps and marshes, believe it or not. They grow really good. Their rice paddies grow very good in marshy land. So um, it's kind of interesting. Interesting, you know. So anyway, guys, I think that's about it for me. Um, I need to go to sleep. So I will do another stream tomorrow. I'll, I'll just do all the text uh, just to show kind of what I was doing for colors. Um, you know, if I turn on the colors, this is really just a color demo for fun. Um, that's more or less what it would end up looking like. But you can imagine you're going to do a lot more of those colors all over the map so that it, the whole thing comes out really colorful. Let me quickly find one that I've done before. Um, let's see here. Let me see. Now right, here's here's one I did that was full color. You know, this was a really quick one. But you know, did the same thing, right? Did lighter areas around the coast, some green, some brown. I didn't do the quite as defined on the mountains for this one. Uh, but it looks subtle, right? It doesn't look like a bunch of colors are smacking you in the face. It's it's more of a subtle look to it in general. So um, that's one. Let me find another one. Oh yeah, that's the same one. Uh, okay, yeah, here, I didn't finish the color version of this one, but that's more or less what the color version ended up looking like. Right? I'd probably do a little bit different approach to colors, but you know, it's not crazy with the colors. Um, but you can get some nice looking color just with flats. You know, if I wanted to, I could turn off the greens. And you could just have two colors and it would look really good with two colors as well. You know, or three colors. Pretty simple. Anyway, that's it folks. Have a good one and I'll see you all next time.